motorcycle clubs. We have talked about Food Truck Friday. We've talked about Jackson Public Schools. And somehow, some way, all of those things kind of connect to my next guest and some of the things that he is doing in downtown Jackson as well. We have the manager of the Russell C. Davis Planetarium, Mr. Mike Williams, joining us. Mike, appreciate you being here. Very frankly, thank you very much. You got to pull that mic up, man. You're really tall, so you got to pull that mic up. So I'm yeah, got to do. get right into the mic. Mic check. One, Try that arm two. right there. That's right. Yeah, there you um, go. Right, how we doing? There you go. All right. So you got it. No, I think so. Yes. All right. All right. Don't tell that nothing. No, I think that's a new. Okay, you in there? All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, you guys recently had a groundbreaking for the planetarium. It was a really big deal. I saw you had your hard hat on out there. <laughs> so did you actually break some ground with the show? Uh, no, no. It was uh, it was mostly decorative. We didn't do the show because we decided to go with a kind of cosmic theme for the hard hats this time. That's dope. That's yeah. dope. So for anyone that has not been paying attention. Uh, to what's going on down there in downtown Jackson. Tell them what's happening with the uh, Jackson Plants here. All right, for anybody living under a moon rock, uh, we have been uh, working on this project now. My goodness, I think I started this thing almost seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and through a lot of, I'd say seven years of sustained community support and from advocates, from people like yourself, to the administration, to the uh, local business and philanthropic community, we have made it through the challenges of COVID, fundraising, and all of that stuff, and uh, we have uh, arrived at our groundbreaking ceremony, which we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we started construction actually in November, and so we're beginning to build our new planetarium. Where's the new building going to be located exactly for folks that don't know? So what I'm doing is uh, renovating the existing structure, and we're building a brand new three-story atrium and uh, like a really grand celebrated entryway. That will adjoin the <coughs> excuse me adjoin the, the existing structure to the art center in Mississippi. All right. So how did that those plans uh, you know come about again? You know I, I was there in the beginning stages. You kind of putting this together. Uh, you know the design and how you want it to look. And you know we can't do the, the PowerPoint presentation because it's radio, <laughs> so they can't see it. We gotta paint the picture. Yeah. Right? So uh, we have to paint the picture for them. So you know how did you come up with the idea for the renovations that are going to be taking place and you know, as opposed to building some new structures, what it was going to take to reconstruct the existing structure that was extremely old that was there. Well, I'll say, honestly, the, the emphasis was me being a space nerd and mm -hmm. walking around the inside of this building as it crumbled around us mm -hmm. and just envisioning what we could do with it. You know, the footprint of the planetarium is a uh, basically a donut. Yeah. And so it kind of evokes a lot of uh, space station imagery anyway. Mm -hmm. And so as, you know, again, as the building deteriorated, I always kind of wondered, well, what could we do to make this place, uh, you know, a little bit more exciting, if given the opportunity. And uh, it, it really started from there. And then we uh, connected with our architects at CDFO. It's a really visionary team from over there. Uh, Chris Myers, Rob Farr, Daniel Ziegel, uh, mm -hmm. and all of us just kind of sat down. Uh, David Lewis was a, a big part of the major, major part of the beginning of this thing. Mm -hmm. We all just kind of sat down and future casted and, through a bunch of nerd spaghetti at the wall and saw what stuck. We've been through a lot of iterations. I remember the first uh, renderings that I showed you were, in retrospect, pretty ridiculous uh, <laughs> per archives and history, but uh, we're really uh, happy with what we've arrived at. And it looks great. It's going to be a great addition to the downtown landscape. So talk about, I guess, the journey to get to this point, uh, because you know a lot of people don't understand the pains that it takes to get people to buy in to a project this large. And not only that, getting people to buy in to doing something new and changing things in the city of Jackson. And we'll backtrack a little bit and talk about that. But you guys had to go ask a lot of different bodies, uh, a lot of different governmental bodies to get on board for this. Uh, there was a lot of people who just did not understand the importance of a planetarium. There were people who said, well, why, why are they asking? Money with a plan. Everything is connected to potholes and crime, <laughs> as if you know we can't work on anything else until we fill every pothole and the crime is down to zero. So there were even some officials who was like, you know, why do we need to be spending money on a planetarium when there's potholes in the street? And the two things, you know, are not you know mutually exclusive at the end of the day. So you know, what did it take? What kind of wrangling and what kind of arm twisting did it take for you guys to get this money together? Well, I'll say this, man. Most of the opposition, I would say almost all of the opposition, came from people who uh, had not had a chance to uh, 
um, talk to us about or or vet the plan, right? And so we were uh, considerate about all of those issues from the beginning of this project. And uh, what usually offsets the the, the money discussion, the potholes, and why would we uh, be worried about the planetarium when I just had to turn my radio down to see if my radio even fell out. Um, you know, what we have done is take out the general obligation bond, and so none of the funding from the planetarium has actually come from the general fund. So we've not taken not a cent away from any of the other uh, necessities of the city, and that was part of the plan from the beginning. You know, and, and we uh, bid it a very sustainable uh, financial projection through, you know, God knows how many attorneys and whatnot, mm-hmm. uh, so that, you know, people understood that this was a viable thing that we'd be able to pay back through the revenue generated from the planetarium. Yeah. Now, how did you get involved with the planetarium? You know, you, you've got uh, a unique story in and of itself, uh, a triumphant story for you, you know, from your beginnings to now being uh, the manager, and you're also the, you're the deputy director of Human and Cultural Services, I believe, as well. So. You know, talk about how you even got involved in the planetarium. You say you're a space nerd, so you know this was a position and a, and, a, and a job that was a dream job for someone who has some of the skill sets that you have. So how did you get involved with the planetarium uh, to even start on this path? Well, you know, as you know, uh, I had a, a production background, and for anybody listening who's interested, me and Brad go way, 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 way back. Uh, we yeah. both uh, we both were a part of the music scene in the late '90s, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to encounter Crooked Letters, and that began uh, what was a, probably a 15-year trajectory of my uh, inclusion in the music industry yeah. uh, here. Yeah. And worked with Brad, worked with Banner for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was also a graphic design student at Jackson State, and so you know the kind of logical convergence there: graphic design and music was uh, AV and video production. And so after a time uh, traveling, living other places, I ended up back here in Jackson. And uh, I started at the planetarium as a production tech. I would not necessarily say that I considered it my dream job as much as a uh, necessity having just uh, had a new baby girl. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, um, I, I started actually, I produced the last in house produced film for the planetarium before we went uh, completely digital. And so, you know, again, the infrastructure was crumbling around us. The management there was I in retirement. Um, ended up being made director maybe three, four years after I got there. And yeah, a strong was, bead on retirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I had the keys. And being the first black planetarium director in the history of the state mm-hmm. and inheriting a crumbling building, and uh, you know, being of the uh, competitive mindset that we that we kind of grew up in, I basically refused to take it and let the um, and, and let its demise have my name attached to it. Well, you know, that's the classic formula that we've seen around here: black guy takes over, and then we just let a building that's already crumbled just go ahead and fall to the ground, and then we blame the black guy for sure. it crumbling now, to the ground. Now, I will say, um, I, I don't think any of it was intentional, and, and I am, no, of course not. I'm always really uh, vocal about the support that I've received from uh, from the administration and from the city of Jackson because a thing of this, uh, a project of this magnitude has required a lot of internal support, a lot of trust. Um, they trusted me to kind of go out and do whatever I needed to do to, and, and run the place to get this thing home. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I won't lay that at their feet, but that is the circumstances that I came into. And yeah. So, you know, luckily, um, like I said, a good friend of both of ours, David Lewis, came on board and he was able to help me uh, open some doors with some people at the Community Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, ran the pitch to them and they were with it. They gave us our seed money, originally a $250,000 uh, gift that then allowed me to go out to the community and pitch to everybody else who would listen. And like I said, it was a, it's a really well vetted plan. Uh, at its core, it's a workforce development project. Mm-hmm. Really because uh, Mississippi has an outsized uh, aerospace industry representation. You know, mostly yeah. because we got stents down at the coast, but we got mm-hmm. a lot of Fortune 100 companies here. You know, we got mm-hmm. uh, the Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, et cetera. And so um, a problem that exists there is that they have at any given moment, um, I think maybe 1,200 available jobs, uh, starting at around 70K. Mm-hmm. that Mississippi only produces about uh, 20% of the technology graduates to fill. And so they have to you know, go outside of the state uh, to, to get people to fill those jobs. It weakens our, 
our at-home workforce representation. And so because we got such broad access to all of the students in the state, and uh, but also as well as to you know a lot of our legislators, I mean, we kind of we kind of touch everybody. It's a really unique position that we have, and so to take advantage of that, and because of the um, sense of responsibility, I guess that I started feeling to the students that used to come through the planetarium when it was open. I mean, all our little brothers and sisters come in, and they're mm -hmm. they're really pumped and excited about uh, space science. You know, and mm -hmm. I noticed that it was in a way that didn't really happen in the museum, you know, and yes. I, I saw it as an opportunity uh, to take advantage of it, man, capitalize it, capitalize on it, and, and, and fill their cups, you know what I mean? What are some features that, you know, people can look forward to in this new structure, uh, you know, how you've modernized it, and, and, you know, how are you going to make up for the time that, for instance, JPS kids have not been able to come to the planetarium, you know, we, I kind of grew up going to the planetarium regularly, and then there was a huge swath of time in between and now you guys have kind of just literally been shut down for three or four years you know what can we be looking forward to in this new structure what are some of the things that you're excited about and what is your outreach plan to get people back into that structure sure um well actually i'm excited about all of it because all of it is new right and so before the main attraction was the the show inside the theater which was really dynamic that's what really stuck out in most people minds love it but that was also because there was not much of an exhibit offering out in the lobby and so we really wanted to focus on um, uh, you know up in the ante there mm -hmm. as well as you know revamping what we got going on inside the theater and really just kind of a holistic approach to what uh, you know how far can we take this how big a swing uh, do we think we can commit and so what I am most excited about is our take on uh, this iteration of planetarium which is basically an experiential one. It'll be the first of its kind in the nation. Uh, I did a lot of uh, site visits in the research phase of this thing. I went to uh, Hayden in Manhattan. I did Adler in Chicago, um, uh, Kennedy down in Orlando, but I also did uh, the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge Park that just opened uh, at Disney. And that ended up being the most influential part of the research phase because all of the other programs despite the fact that they had you know, billions of dollars in endowments and funding, uh, their approach to uh, planetariums was decidedly broad rear face and it was very museum-esque. Mm. And you know, uh, space science being inherently about futurism, progressivism, uh, we just didn't find that to be uh, an exciting approach. You know, right. We didn't, wanna, we didn't right. wanna do the same thing that everybody else was doing, especially given an opportunity you know, with a clean slate to start from the beginning. So at Disney, we noticed um, that everything was so immersive. I mean, down to the screw heads, man. You know, you're really in the world when you get there. But what else we noticed too was it was a decidedly lo-fi approach to the design. Mm -hmm. And you know, mostly because of the industrial kind of uh, design uh, that a lot of Star Wars stuff has. But frankly, you could go to the hardware store and get a lot of that stuff and with some intentional, you know, design. That's that's how they come up with these immersive worlds. And so when you scale it down square foot for square foot. We no longer got the money the mouse guy, you know. Hey, you right. Hey, but right. we were, um, but we did think that we could, again, with a really intentional approach to the design, create a really immersive uh, experience for everybody. So we partnered with uh, a theme attraction company out of uh, out of Florida, uh, and they have worked on a number of theme attractions at Universal Studios. They won awards for stuff they did for National Geographic, and so you know we endeavored to make an experiential uh, planetarium. And so. Everything up there will be something that you have not seen in the planetarium as well. So, um, the planetarium game, as far as the state of Mississippi is concerned, uh, just talk about other planetariums that you visited and how they were able to, you know, create partnerships in their communities. And you know, what have you seen in other places that are working models that you hope to use here to get this new iteration of the planetarium to be successful? Well, you know, most planetariums are not municipally owned, and so that's created um, you know a number of uh, challenges unique to this project so you know a lot of them have endowments from you know universities and uh, foundations that go back you know uh, sometimes 80 and 100 years mm -hmm. and so you know given that we're a municipal facility uh, we face a different set of challenges than they do I mean, we operate on an annual operating budget and that's pretty much it I would say about 12 years ago we um, were blessed to get an endowment from the Marie R. Horner Foundation. Marie R. Horner was a lady who used to love to come to the planetarium, her and a gentleman named Jack Horkheimer. 
And um, when she passed, she left an endowment that uh, wow, okay. yeah, yeah, that spins off uh, a gift every year for uh, the planetarium, uh, her church, and the animal rescue league. And so that really sustained us kind of when we were down in the dirt. I will say also while we were down, you know, in order to continue some form of service provision, I started doing a, uh, a free NASA Astro Camp every year that we offer. Uh, again, for free to you know whoever wants to take part. We usually end up getting a lot of JPS students, but mm -hmm. of course we'll take anybody that wants to that wants to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. That's been really successful. Right. Uh, again, that endowment helps sustain that as well. So you know we to say what we want to take from other models, I, I really say not a lot. I mean we're we're operating on a you know a different a different plane right now. You know so, right. um, but it's not been terribly difficult to get people to buy into an educational project. You know, at its core, most people are uh, supportive of that. So it's really been working around a lot of the stigma, a lot of the negative stigma that, that seems to, you know, follow around, uh, follow the city of Jackson around and, and be pumped up, you know, from uh, various bad actors, you know, and then we have to fight that. But, you know, all it takes is communication. And once we sit down and really talk with people, identify our shared values and goals, it's, it's pretty much been successful for me. So my last question is, what's going to happen to, uh, Think my favorite piece of the planetary for the people who are, are my age and at my age graphic uh, that projector that comes out of the out of the uh, out of the ground in the uh, in the theater that used to project uh, the shows that we would go and watch when I was a young youth, a young lad going to the planetary and watching those shows. What's going to happen with that? Is it going to be preserved? Okay, so for people in your demographic, well, for all my seventy-six year olds out there, I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> No, we are uh, actually. It's 1976. We right. had to. Uh, we had to decommission. Uh, we we used to call him Jake. We had to decommission Jake. Uh, we took it down, and uh, it, it'll be in storage. We thought about putting it on display, but frankly, we don't have the kind of. You should, footage. man. You gotta put it someplace, it's, man. It's in some place, but we don't have the kind of square footage to uh, to display. It's pretty big. Uh, yeah, I only mean it's massive. I don't think yeah. a lot of people realize it. Yeah, it's huge. We broke a uh, a one ton winch trying to get it out. So, yeah, it's, it's big. It's big. Wow. It's cumbersome. And so, you know, it just ended up not being um, at the top of the priority list for us. But, you know, much respect to Jake. RIP, you served well. He did. He served us all well. So, again, what is the time frame for the uh, new structure to be open? What's the projected date? We're looking at probably late summer 2025, you know, given we don't get any kind of crazy weather delays or anything for construction. And so far, construction has been going great. Um, construction has been fantastic partners. And uh, we met all of our goals so far, and we want to continue to do so. And uh, hopefully we stay online and can reopen back to the public next summer. So if anybody's got any questions or they want to get in touch with you to talk about the, the new planetarium, or maybe they have some ideas they want to pass on to you, how can they do it? Yeah, we're certainly open to it. I would say I've been working off of my uh, personal phone number for so long, and I'm not about to drop that on the radio, but I would say definitely go to our website, uh, at the City of Jackson page for the Department of Human and Cultural Services, and all of my contact information. There it is. Mike Williams with the Russell C. Davis Planetarium is going to be getting a new look, a new building, a new structure. There's going to be new amenities. There's going to be new features on the inside. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to rival any planetarium that exists out there in the world. And that's happening right here inside the city of Jackson. In the city of Jackson, it's happening. It's definitely a good thing, a great thing that is happening in this city. So, uh, you know, look forward to it and look forward to patronizing the planetarium when it opens late summer of 2025. And thank you guys for listening to us and tuning in today. Hope you heard something uh, that you, of course, is going to attend and support and hope you have heard these good things that are going on in the city of Jackson and pass these things on to other people. Share the story with them. Share the Facebook page, share the Instagram page. We are changing the narrative about what's happening in the city of Jackson, all right? We appreciate you guys for staying with us. We're going to holler at you guys next time, all right? This is Brad Kamikaze Franklin, The Good Things Jackson Show on 97.7, the beat of the capital. Holler at you guys later. Peace. Amen.